Welcome to Steps to Life. Ask the beasts, and they will teach you. And the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you. And the fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? Before we study together, let's pray and ask the Lord to help us understand what we're going to study together. Father in heaven, we come to you very humbly, but very earnestly, because we want to know your will. We want to do your will. We want to worship you in spirit and in truth. We want to be part of that festal assembly that is gathered from all nations and all ages to one place. You have promised us that you're going to gather all of the human family into one place in John the 11th chapter. We pray that we may all be there and help us now as we study together to understand the truth. Give us a heart to obey and follow you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. It would be very easy for me to uh, open our remarks today by studying and explaining some verses uh, from Revelation 13, but I think that instead I'll read you an interesting statement. If you have the book Selected Messages, it's on page 380, uh, volume 2 of Selected Messages. This comes from a letter that was written by Ellen White in 1886. Now, the world in 1886 was so different from now that we can't even imagine it. In 1886, the people weren't driving in, on, in automobiles. There were not paved roads around the United States. We thought we had really accomplished something tremendous just 20 years before that to get the railroad across the United States. So you could get across the United States in three or four days on a train. And those. So it, it wasn't like it had been uh, 50 years before. Uh, and, of course, things like the telephone were just being invented and starting to be used. And in the big cities like New York, they were just starting. The, Edison was working on things like inventing electric lights. And, and so we were, we were just starting to reap some of the benefits of the uh, Industrial Revolution. 
at that time, but we, we were nowhere near where we are today as far as technology. But uh, Ellen White wrote to a letter. This is called Letter 55. It's one of the more famous letters she wrote. She was in Basel, Switzerland uh, when she wrote this letter, and she wrote this letter to the General Conference President of Seventh-day Adventists. His name was Butler, and also to one of our leading ministers. His name was Haskell. And uh, so they received this letter from her. It's a long letter. Uh, I'm just going to read just a few sentences. Uh, it says, Everything in God's world, both men and doctrines and nature itself, is fulfilling God's sure word of prophecy and accomplishing his grand and closing work in this world's history. We often don't think about that. Everything that is going on has a purpose. And the purpose is to finish God's plan in history. Does God have a plan? God has a plan. He has a plan for the world. He has a plan in history. He has a plan in allowing different nations to exist and have different opportunities. God also has plans for every human being. God has plans for you. And she says, God's great closing work in history, she says, everything is going to be fulfilled in his grand and closing work in this world's history. She says, we are to be ready and waiting for the orders of God. Nations will be stirred to their very center. Now this was a prophecy about what would happen in the future. It hadn't happened then. She said, nations will be stirred to their very center. Now that hasn't happened even yet, but it's in the process of happening, I believe. It's starting to happen. Nations are going to be stirred to their very center. Now this shaking up, now the Bible predicts this. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, it says everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Nations are going to be stirred to the very center. What is it that's going to shake the nations up and... Well, there are several things. One of the things that is going to shake the nations to their center is that in the very last days there is going to be a financial crisis such as the world has never experienced before. We are living, by the way, in times of financial crisis. Yesterday, I received an email from a well-known financial analyst on the East Coast. I received many emails from this person. I always read this person's emails. I'm not saying that he's always right, but this fellow has spent a lot of time studying. This is his email. I, he actually sent it Thursday. I didn't get it till yesterday. I'm often a day behind and get my emails. I'd like to read just a few sentences from this email. He's talking about a, a new book that was written by Michael Lewis called The Big Short, and he says, it's a great explanation of the subprime debt bubble hidden within the story of three hedge funds making a once-in-a-lifetime killing. This time, Wall Street itself was the dumb money. It is also a great explanation of why the forces of deflation are so strong. Lewis shows the subprime crisis was a symptom of the same gargantuan credit bubble that crafted the culture 25 years ago at Salomon Brothers. That was a famous uh, and very wealthy trading firm in, in the 80s, in Wall Street. It fueled the entire world with borrowed money and lifted the S&P, that's stocks, S lifted the S&P 500 from 100 to 1,500. It's not that high now, but it, it did go up that high. Unbelievably, now this is what he comments on this. Unbelievably, the credit bubble is still expanding. The Fed is now using government balance sheets to sustain it. When governments max out their credit lines, it'll be curtains for the world economy. Now just for your interest, uh, if you haven't studied up on this, people think that we're maxed out with credit here in the United States. But the, the governments in Europe are maxed out even more than we are. Their banks are maxed out and their governments are maxed out more than we are. 
He says, when governments max out their credit lines, it'll be curtains for the world economy. There won't be anything left to hawk. The credit bubble will deflate. And we'll see a decade of defaults, liquidations, and fire sales. I don't see any way to stop this from happening. And when the Fed tries to fix the situation by printing money and guaranteeing debts, it'll only make things worse. The markets will tank every time the Fed announces a bailout. Well, at the same time, he sees something like that happening in the financial world. Yesterday, I saw something else. I checked the news yesterday on the Internet, and uh, an executive in Shell Oil Company just issued a warning to all the governments of the world, and especially to the United States government, and he said, listen, if you ban offshore drilling, you will cause a worse crisis for shortage of oil than you can have any idea. And you could see gasoline go up to close to $10 a gallon. And let me tell you something, if something like that happened, you know what it would do? It would cause a collapse in a worldwide economy. It would cause a financial collapse in every country in the world. Now, Ellen White said, nations will be stirred to their very center. What's going to happen when nations are stirred to their very center? Well, I'll tell you what's going to happen. The book of Revelation predicts what's going to happen. Times are going to get tough enough, and people are going to be shaken enough by what they see going on. See, it's all, all kinds of different things. There's so many things going on, you can't even keep up with it. Uh, people right now, of course, if you when you go to... The, the other day I was in the bank, and uh, one, of the, one of the banks in Wichita, and uh, one of the executives in the bank was talking to me, and, and uh, he said, well, he says, nowadays, he says, all they have, we have the CNN news channel on, he says, all they're talking about all day long is this oil spill. And uh, so people are very concerned about that, and people are angry about that too, by the way. And so you have that going on, but uh, people, because of this concentrated on that, they don't seem to be aware that, are you aware of the fact in the last few days we have had a tremendous risk of a, a world war starting in Israel? And are you aware of the fact that at the same time that's been going on, uh, we've been had the potential of a conflict starting in South Korea again? And so we have, all these, we have so many things going on, at the same time we can't even keep up with it all. Uh, she says, nations will be stirred to their very center. What happens when nations get stirred to their very center and people just, they just feel like it's hopeless. Let's just look back at history a little bit. Right after, just in the next few days after 9-11 in 2001, what happened the next Sunday? You remember? Everybody went to church. I mean, the churches were loaded all over the United States. People that hadn't been to church for years went to church. Now, wh why did they go to church? They were scared. They were scared. Now, I'm not trying to criticize anybody that goes to church because they're scared. I'm not trying to criticize them for that. But it is interesting when you look at that, people went to church because they were scared. They were, as we would say, they were shook. They were shaken. So... When you look at the past and you see, by the way, when people were really shaken because what was happening in, in the world, in the economic world during the 1930s, a lot more people were going to church. And there were a lot of people that were, went to church because they were scared in the 40s because of the war that was going on around the world. So when nations are shaken to their very center and people are shaken... What are they going to do? They're going to turn to religion. Now, people that have never been interested in religion are going to turn to religion. Now, let's think this through for a while. These people are not converted. If they were converted, they'd have been going to church before that happened. They're not converted. But millions of people that ha are not interested in religion right now are going to turn to religion. Now, remember, they're not converted, but they're scared. So they're going to turn to religion. 
Now let's just think that through for a moment. If you're not converted, in other words, you're not turning so much because you love the Lord, because you're scared and you want help. So you figure God can help you, so you're going to go to church. Let me ask you this question. I want you to think. It's good to think in church. These millions of people, and and by the way, I'd probably be more accurate to say billions of people. When they're shook and they're going to go to church, what what churches are they going to go to? Well, let's just think that through for a minute. Most of the people in the Middle East, the majority of people in the Middle East, are the Muslim religion. So when they get shook, what church are they going to go to? They're going to go to a mosque. They're going to go to a center of the Muslim religion. Now, my parents used to be Christian missionaries. In the, we called it Burma back then. They called it Myanmar now. They changed the names of those places. The Ma- Burma and Myanmar is just across the way, a little east from India. If you look at the map, India comes down like that, and then it goes, then over here is Burma. Well, I, it's opposite from what you're looking at it in. It's to the east. And the majority of people there are Buddhists. So when they all get shook, where are they going to go to church? They're going to go to a Buddhist temple. I've been in Buddhist temple, by the way. Uh, when I was a small child, my parents were missionaries over there. Where I've been taken to those places, and everybody's shoes outside. You have to leave your shoes outside. You have to walk in without shoes. They don't allow shoes on inside. You have to show reverence to their idol. And you go inside there, and there's just this huge, huge gold-plated idol of Buddha. And they kneel down, and they're, they're praying to it. And... Uh, the, if they're educated Buddha, they'll say, we're not, a-, the, the Roman Catholics do the same thing. The, the educated Buddhists will say, we're not really pr- worshiping the image, we're just praying to who the image represents. See, we're not, we're not, really, we're not really practicing idolatry, we're just we're praying to who the image represents. Uh, and the Roman Catholics say almost the same thing. However, read in your Bible in uh, Exodus 20, Verses 4 to 6, the second commandment, the second longest commandment is the second commandment. It's 43 words in the Hebrew language, and the Lord is very specific. It says, because the Lord knew how devious we were in trying to get around his requirements. And he said, concerning images and idols, he said, you are not to bow down. Now, you can say anything you want to. The second commandment says, do not bow down. I've been in Catholic churches and I've, I've wondered, what are, what are these going through these people's minds? Because these are Christians, and, 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 the, and they are bowing down in front of this. Do you know what's going through their minds? The second commandment isn't even in their minds, because in the Roman Catholic catechism, most Roman Catholics study the catechism much more than they read the Bible. And in, the, in, in their Bible, the second commandment is there. But in the Roman Catholic catechism, the second commandment isn't even there. It's left out. Just look in a Roman Catholic catechism. I have one in my office and one at home. It's not even there. So most Roman Catholics don't even know that the second commandment exists because in their catechism, it's not there. And what has happened is, then that changes the numbering of all the commandments. You need to know this when you're talking to a Roman Catholic because if you ask a Roman Catholic... uh, what is the third commandment? They say the third commandment is the commandment that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. <laughs> oh, really? Well, then what's the second commandment? Well, the second commandment says not to swear. Because, you see, they took the second commandment out of the catechism, and then they put the third commandment in there, and then the fourth commandment is in place of the third, and it's that way all the way till you get to the end. And then what if you get to the end in the catechism, the uh, tenth commandment split up into two. The tenth commandment says... The Tenth Commandment, by the way, says, specifies seven things that you're not to covet. Read it in your own Bible. Seven things. The Tenth Commandment specifies seven things that you are not to covet. By the way, is, is seven a significant number in the Bible? Yes. Seven is a significant number. 
sometime, if I have time, just for the fun of it, I'm going to preach a sermon about seven in the Ten Commandments. It's astonishing. In the, in the Fourth Commandment, it mentions seven categories of people that are not to work on the Sabbath. In the Tenth Commandment, it mentions seven categories of things you're not to covet. In the fir- and the First Commandment in the Ten Commandments has, guess how many words? Seven words in Hebrew. Well, anyway... Uh, the Tenth Commandment in the Roman Catholic Catechism is split up into two. So it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And that way you come out with the same number, ten. But these people in the Buddhist countries, they're, when they're all shook because of what's going on in the world, it says here, nations will be stirred to their very center. When they're shook, they're going to go to a Buddhist temple. The Muslims are going to go to a mosque. If your family, now in South America, Central America, and many European countries, the majority of people in those countries, they don't go to church much. It's interesting if you've traveled down there. They don't go to church much, but they claim to be, they profess to be Roman Catholics. They may only go to church two or three times a year, but they profess to be Roman Catholics. So when they're shook because of what's going on in the world, where are they going to go to church? You're going to go to a Roman Catholic Church. Now, in the United States, now a large percentage of the people in the United States are Roman Catholic too, but not an actual majority. In the United States, probably the majority of people, when they get really shook, where are they going to go? Well, they're going to go to whatever church, probably their family or their grandmother or somebody that they know has gone there, so they, they feel like they have some connection because their grandmother, the grandfather, or some relative, so they'll go to one of those churches. Could be whatever their grandmother or grandfather went to church. Could be Methodist church, Baptist church, Christian church. Now let's think this through. She says, the nations will be stirred to the very center. Now when you're shook, where do people go? They, they want security. They, they go to whatever church they've, got, they've had some ties with in the past. So I've just described to you where they're going to go to church. Some will be going to the Buddhist temples. There's Buddhists in Wichita. They have a temple here too. And uh, some will be going to the mosque, to a Muslim church. Some will be going to a Catholic church. Some will be going to different Protestant churches. Okay? So that's where they're going to go. Now, when you start to think that through, what day of the week do the majority of the religious people in the world go to church? Now, don't answer too quick, because this is a trick question. By a slim majority, and I say slim majority, the majority of people that go to church, go to church on Sunday. Now, it's a slim majority because the Muslims, they go to church often on Friday. Now that's interesting. I, I won't go into history as to why that is. There's some very interesting reasons behind why that is. That's not an accident that they go to church on Friday. The majority, the, the, the great majority of Christians go to church on Sunday. The Jews go to church on Saturday, and a few Christians. But by a slim majority, majority goes to church on Sunday. So you're going to have, all of a sudden, you're going to have this flock of people that's going to go to these churches. They're going to get religious. Now remember, these people aren't converted. But they're going to church because they're scared. And so they're going to want a way out of their dilemma. Or I should say their dilemmas, plural. See, the problems we're facing in the world are not just one or two. There's a whole interlocking series of problems that the world is facing today. And these problems are going to get so bad, we haven't even talked about the problem of crime. We haven't even talked about that. All these problems are going to be so bad that people are going to be scared and they're going to want, they're going to, want to get a solution. And, as they, and they go to church and then the problems get worse and worse and worse. Now, if you're not converted, you're going to church because you're scared. And the problems in the world are getting worse. And the crime is getting worse. What will you want to do? Well... Remember now, these are people that are not converted. Well, they're going to see the solution is what we need is religious legislation to make people be good. 
is religious legislation to make people be good so that the world be better. Is that coming? Well, yes, it is, because Revelation 13 very clearly predicts that there is going to be religious legislation in the last days. What's the purpose of religious legislation? It's always had one purpose, to make people be good. Make the world better. Well, now, how are you going to make people be good? <laughs> you ever try to figure that out? How are you going to make people be good? Now, let's read what Jesus said about it. Uh, look in the book of Matthew, the... Uh, People have been doing this for a long time, trying to make other people be good. This is what the Jews were doing before and during the time of Christ. They had all kinds of religious laws to make people be good. That's why they had so many rules, trying to make people be good. Look in Matthew 23. And let's read verses 25 and 26. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Now notice what is the problem. The problem is they cleaned up the outside. And by the way, that's all that you can do with religious legislation. You can make people act in a certain way. Clean up the outside. But can you change their heart with religious legislation? No, you can't. You can't change their heart. And here's the catch. In order to enter the kingdom of heaven, your heart has to be changed. If you go through all the motions so that you look righteous on the outside, but your heart isn't changed, can you enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, no, you can't. The Bible's very clear about this. There's many texts that we could read. Uh, let's just look at one here in Psalm 24. We could look in Psalm 15 or several other Psalms or in the New Testament. But look in Psalm 24. Look at verse 3 and 4. It says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Notice, your hands have to do with the outside what people can see. That's what you do. But you can't enter heaven. You cannot be with the Lord just if you have clean hands. You have to have something else. What's the other thing you have to have? You have to have a pure heart. A pure heart. And so Jesus said, we just read it, He said, clean up the inside first. When you clean up the inside, then you're going to be able to clean up the outside too. Clean up the inside first. But when unconverted people turn to religion, their hearts aren't changed. That's what conversion is, is change of heart. Their hearts aren't changed, but they see the world is in such a mess that we need out of this mess, and we need to ask the Lord to help us to get out of this mess. And so they're going to turn to religious legislation to make people be good. The book of Revelation, the 13th chapter, clearly predicts this. Okay, so when they're going to do religious legislation, let's just think this through for a moment. When you do legislation, do you enact legislation generally on the basis of the wishes of the majority or the minority? Which, which is it? The majority. Now, I said the majority is slim because the Muslim world worships on Friday, but there still is a majority. What is, what is the day of the week that the majority of people worship on? Sunday. And friends, if you're going to try to make people be good by religious legislation, what do you want them to do? You want them to go to church. How are you going to get them to go to church? Well, first of all, you need a law so that the place of business will be closed down so that they'll be free to go to church. By the way, 
Everything we're talking about has already happened in the past. It's going to happen again in the future, but it's happened in the past. The, there was a law given by Constantine, clear back in 21 in the Roman Empire, and this is what this is for. They, they wanted a, the, a law, it was a Sunday law, it was the first Sunday law, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> it was a law so that people would be free to go to church on Sunday. By the way, it was, a, it was very handy because Sunday already was a holiday for the pagans. So it was just a handy thing that they said, you know, the Christians said Christ rose on this day. Pagan says, well, we worship the sun on this day. That's why, where we get the name Sunday. So they said, Constantine said, we'll just bring everybody together. And so he passed his first Sunday law. But you know what happened? People, when they were free, they didn't go to church. So if you study what happened during the successive Sunday laws that they had during the 4th century, they said, well, the people are going to the circus. They're not going to church. They're going to the circus. They, we closed down the businesses, so they're going to the circus. So they said, well, we need another Sunday law. So they made another Sunday law, and they said, we're going to close down the circuses. So they closed down the circus. This is the places of amusement. Closed down the businesses. Now it's closed down the places of amusement. And you know what happened then? People couldn't go, go to work, and they couldn't go to the circus, and they just stayed home or did whatever they wanted to. They still didn't go to church. So finally, you know what they did? I don't think it'll take many years this time like it took then. That's when they were learning how to do this. So they finally, they said, they finally passed a law and they said, not only are we going to close the circuses, not only are we going to close the places of businesses, we're going to make a law that you have to go to church on Sunday. And we're going to, make, we're going to get you to church on Sunday. And the way we're going to do it is that in this law, if you don't go to church, we're going to take one half of your estate. Whatever you're worth, we're going to, the state's just going to confiscate half of it. They actually made that law. Well, somebody said, well, then how about the, the, the slaves and the serfs that don't have anything? They said, those people are going to be whipped. That was in the law, too. If you don't have anything we can take, then we'll give you a, a scourging. Now, something similar to that is going to happen again. We don't know exactly how it'll happen, but something similar to that is going to happen again. Revelation 13 clearly predicts it. And in, when Ellen White's talking about this, nations being stirred to their very center, this is what she says will happen. She says, nations will be stirred to their very center. Support will be withdrawn from those who proclaim God's only standard of righteousness, the only sure test of character. What is God's only standard of righteousness? God just has one standard of righteousness. What is it? It's his law, his commandments. All your commandments are righteousness, it says. Psalm 119. Oh, what is that, about 172? So, both the Old and New Testament make it very clear that God's only standard of righteousness is his law, the Ten Commandment law. Now, if you proclaim God's only standard of righteousness and say that is the only test of character, she says support is going to be withdrawn. Support is going to be withdrawn. You see, people today, even the people that want to be religious, people want an easy religion. They want an easy religion. They don't want the standards to be so high. I receive books. I have a number of books in my library, as you can imagine, about churches and church growth. And there are many authors have written that. They said, if you want your church to really grow, to become a big church, what you must do is not have the standards of your church too high, because then the people won't come. You've got to get the standards down so that people will come. That's, that's published. That's been published for years. And if you look around... The biggest churches are the churches that have the lowest standards. Now, they proclaim to have the highest standards, but you can be in if you follow the lowest standards. Let me give you an example. I have a good friend. She used to live in California. She still lives in California sometimes. But this friend is... She grew up, and she is a native, actually, of the Middle East, in the Middle East. She was talking to me one time about 
the Muslim religion, because she's very familiar with it. She grew up in the Middle East. And she was telling me how she said, one of the reasons that the Muslim religion is so popular is that you can do almost anything you please. You just, there's just almost no standard. She says, now, there are a few, a little bit of standard. She says they do have a regulation about marriage in the Muslim religion. And this is their regulation, she said, told me. They have a regulation that a man may not have more than four wives. But as long as you're within that, everything's okay. And by the way, there are countries over there that wives have been beat up and actually murdered. And there's been almost no prosecution. Because that's another story. You can study the history of the what's going on in Muslim countries yourself. We have, my wife has a number of books on that. We have a number of books on that in our library. But if you raise the standard, people say, no, I can't, I can't live with that. So if you want your church to grow, you need to get the standard down low so everybody can, everybody can get in. We're living in a time when people want an easy religion. And did you know that the Bible predicted that we would be living in a time like that in the last days? The Bible predicts that. Turn to uh, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, the third chapter. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And then he lists a whole series, almost 20, of different awful social conditions that will exist in the last days. And he says in verse 5, he says, he's talking about the last days, he says, they will have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Now what's the form of godliness? That's when you go to church. And that's what's going to happen in the last days. There's going to be legislation that's going to force people to go to church on Sunday. But it says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Now I want to ask you this question. What is the power of godliness? What is the power of godliness? Paul discusses the power of godliness in several different places in his epistles. If you want to look at one, look in Romans, the 8th chapter. And here, Paul says that, verse 3, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And he goes on and discusses this in detail in the next several verses. And he says that the one that has the fleshly mind, now in the King James Version, it uses the word carnal. Now the word carnal is just a Latin word that means flesh. So flesh and carnal is all the same thing. He says the person that has a fleshly mind, a carnal mind, is not obedient to the law of God, and he cannot be. And so he says those that are in the flesh, they can't please God. But he says, speaking to the Christian, he says, you're not that way. Look in verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And so he's speaking to these people, and he says, The righteousness of the law is fulfilled in you. That's verse 4. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. If you walk according to the Spirit, the Spirit of God living in you changes your life so that your life is in harmony with the law of God. That's the power of godliness. And you can't do that 
on your own. Because he goes on to say here, and we just, I just quoted it, but it's in verse 7. He says, the fleshly mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. He says, the unconverted man, the, flesh, the man that has a fleshly carnal heart, he cannot keep the law of God. It's impossible. I've had many, many people tell me that it was impossible to keep the law of God. I've never argued with them because I know they're telling me the truth. They're telling me the truth. When somebody says to me, I can't keep the law of God, I, can, I understand. You can't keep the law of God, and that's true. The Bible says so. You can't. But here's what people fail to realize. If you surrender your life to God and you surrender your life to the sovereignty, that is the lordship of Jesus Christ, and you acknowledge him as the lord of your life and you choose to follow him and acknowledge him as your savior from your sins, he will not only forgive your sins, but he will give to you the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will give you the power to live a new kind of life. That's the power of godliness. And that's why, by the way, I used to wonder when I was young, I tried to sort this all out. And I read, I read all the different texts in the Bible. On the one hand, the Bible says you're saved by grace alone. Okay, well, you're saved by grace alone. But I can read you a whole bunch of texts. It says in the judgment, the judgment is according to works alone. I can read you a text after text. Jesus said it in Matthew 16. John said it in Revelation 20. Paul said it in 2 Corinthians 5. The Bible says over and over again that the judgment is on the basis of works alone. And yet you're saved by grace alone. Yeah, can you figure that out? Well, here's the answer. When you surrender your life to Jesus so that he's the Lord of your life, he's your Savior from it, and you choose to follow him, he not only forgives your sins, but He gives to you the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gives you the power to live a new life. So as Paul says in Philippians, it's not you, it's God working in you. It's the Holy Spirit working in you. So why is the judgment on the basis of works? The judgment is God has made it simple. Here's the explanation. Your works, think it through, your works show whether the Holy Spirit is working in you or not. Because if the Holy Spirit's not working in you and you're still of, of a fleshly mind, are you going to be keeping the law of God? No, you're not. Paul said it's impossible. It is impossible for a sinful man or woman to keep the law of God, and we're all sinful. We can't keep it. He says that. Read it again in your Bible, Romans 8, 7. It's impossible. It cannot be. But when you're born again, the Holy Spirit can work things out in your life that you can't do. And so in the judgment, all God has to ask is just this question. Does this person keep my law or not? That's the only question he needs to ask. Why? Simple. Because if the Holy Spirit was in your life, then you will have been keeping the law. And if the Holy Spirit was not in your life, you will not have been keeping the law, not from your heart. You may go through the motions on the outside. So that's the only question God needs to ask. Because your life shows whether you have, your works show whether you have received the Holy Spirit or not. And remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus, if you're not born of the Spirit, can you go to the kingdom of heaven? Well, no. It's impossible. That's John 3, verse 5 and verse 3. So what's the problem in the last days? The problem is people have a form of godliness. They're going to get so scared because of everything going on in the world, they're going to go to church. And they're going to decide they have to pass a law to get everybody else to go to church, and the majority go to church on Sunday, so that's the day we're going to have everybody go to church. But friend, a form of godliness will never save you. A form of godliness will never save you. There will still be some people, if I'm alive, when this all happens, I hope that by the grace of God I'm one of them. There will still be some people saying, God's only standard of character is his law. So if you want to be ready, if you want to escape the trouble that's coming, what you need to do is to keep the law of God. Here's what's going to happen. 
She says, support will be withdrawn from those who proclaim God's only standard of righteousness, the only sure test of character, and all who will not bow to the decree of the national councils and obey the national laws to exalt the Sabbath instituted by the man of sin. That's the papacy. And by the way, if you study church history, it's not hard to discover the religious organization that changed and got people worshiping on Sunday was Rome itself. That's well documented. That's not some hearsay. That is well documented historically. Most Protestants are unaware of who they're really following and obeying. Sunday worship is instituted by the papacy. That's where it started. That's uh, that, and back in the second century, and that's who's promoted it. That's who is in back of it. And there wasn't the apostles. All who will not bow to the decree of the national councils and obey the national laws to exalt the Sabbath instituted by the man of sin to, dis to the disregard of God's holy day will feel not the oppressive power of popery alone, but of the Protestant world, the image of the beast. Satan will work his miracles to deceive. He will set up his power as supreme. The book of Revelation, I've mentioned this before, so I'll just mention it in passing. If you haven't studied it out, you can study it in half an hour in your own home. From Revelation 12 to the end of the book. It's very, very clear that the way the devil will get control of the whole world in the last days is by the spirits working miracles. Now, we're already seeing some of it, but we're going to see a lot more. And it's through these miracles people are going to be led. By the way, if you have, I have a book in my library written by an Adventist preacher called Sunday is Coming. And he documents in here, in this book, what different spirit apparitions are saying. Now, one of the most popular spirit apparitions today is the Virgin Mary. Now, I'm just going to be real blunt with you. If you haven't studied this out, you'll have to study it on your own. People think that they're talking with the Virgin Mary. Danny Vieira wrote a book called Is the Virgin Mary Dead or Alive? There's very good historical evidence, friends, if you want to study this, that the Virgin Mary died in the first century. And the Bible says the dead don't know anything. But people think that they're talking to the Virgin Mary, but they're not really talking to the Virgin Mary because she's dead. They're talking to a spirit that is appearing as the Virgin Mary. And it's interesting what this spirit is telling people. Have you ever read what this spirit, the, and in this book, uh, Sunday's Coming, tells some of the things that this apparition of the Virgin Mary is telling people. She's, one of the things she's telling people is that they should count the rosary more often. Now, by the way, is there anything about the rosary in the Bible? The rosary comes directly from the pagan heathen religions. Well, like I told you, my parents used to be missionaries in Myanmar, and they have all that kind of stuff over there, the Buddhists do. They've had it for thousands of years. They had it before the Christians. But another thing that the Virgin Mary is telling these people, she's talking to them about confession, of course, to the priest and so forth. And she's telling them that they need to go to church on Sunday. Now, it's interesting, if you read Roman Catholic authors, Roman Catholic theologians, I didn't bring the book, I have the book in my library, Roman Catlow O'Brien, the publisher of a book, I think called Faith of Millions, about 1974, he wrote about this in his book, and this is what he said in his book. He said, now this is a Roman Catholic author, this is not a Protestant. He said, he said, can you find anything in the Bible authorizing the worship of Sunday? He says, no, he says, there's not a thing in the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I've read the whole thing, and it's not there. So the Roman Catholic Authors will tell you that there's nothing in the whole Bible from beginning to end authorizing Sunday. But the vir these apparitions of the Virgin Mary are telling people to go to church on Sunday. What should that tell you? Well, let me tell you what that should tell you. Look in your Bible in Isaiah 8. Now, Isaiah 8, if you look at the whole context, is actually a prophecy about the last days that we're living in. And in Isaiah 8, it talks about the fact how 
there are going to be spirits in the last days that are going to be talking to people. And Isaiah tells you what you need to be careful of when you're hearing these messages from spirits. Look at what it says in Isaiah 8, starting in the 19th verse. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God, for the living to the dead, or instead of the dead, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is what? No light in them. Now I need, I, I need to be very careful that we understand what this text means and don't misapply it to somebody it's not talking about. Let's be very careful. This text is not talking about some preacher that may be confused about the law of God. That, that's not talking about that. I believe, I know for a while, because know, I've known some, I have known of preachers who were Sunday-keeping preachers who were not preaching the law of God and are not teaching the law of God, but you can't say that there was no light in them because they loved Jesus and they were trying to follow all the light they knew. This is not talking about human preachers or human teachers that might be mixed up on something. It's not talking about them. They may be sincere Christians and may just not know any better yet. And there have been millions of people like that. We're not talking about that. This verse is talking about spirits. Did you notice the context in verse 19? It's talking about spirits. Now let me tell you something, friend. The evil spirits, and the New Testament talks about this a lot. It talks about these evil spirits, the fallen angels in 2 Peter and also in Jude. Jesus had a lot to say about it himself in the Gospels. These evil spirits, they are not ignorant about the law of God. Now, there have been human preachers that didn't understand things because of the way they were brought up, and they just never, they didn't understand some things. But this verse isn't talking about them. It doesn't say that some preacher that's confused about the law of God, that there's no light in him. It's not talking about him. He may love Jesus and be following all the truth he knows. This verse is talking about spirits. And if a spirit comes to you, and tells you something that is contrary to the law of God, what does this text tell you that you should know? There's no light in them. That means they're an evil spirit. So when you look at Isaiah 8.20, what does that show you when you find out that the apparitions of the Virgin Mary are telling people to keep Sunday instead of keeping the fourth commandment? What does that tell you? That tells you that this apparition is an evil spirit. There's no light in it. And it's going to deceive you if you listen to it. Is the devil going to deceive the whole world through spirits in the last days? Yes, he is. Read Revelation 16, verses 13 and 14. It talks about these spirits of demons that are going to go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world. They're going to deceive the whole world. How are they going to do it? Oh, it says how they're going to do it. These spirits are going to work miracles. Now here's going to be the dividing line in the last days. Are you going to believe the testimony of spirits that work miracles when they tell you something that's contrary to the law of God? Or are you going to believe the testimony of the scriptures? That's where the line's going to be drawn. Everybody's going to be on one side or the other of the line. Are you going to believe the testimony of spirits that work miracles? Or are you going to believe the testimony of the Bible, the Word of God? Revelation says that there's going to be a few people. It's going to be a time of great lawlessness. But there are going to be a few people that are going to take their position on keeping the commandments of God in the last days. It's very interesting, the context of this verse. Because the context of this verse is the third angel's message. The third angel's message starts in Revelation 14, 9. It finishes in verse 12. And the context is the warning, don't worship the Antichrist. Don't worship the image of the Antichrist. Don't receive the mark of the Antichrist. That's the context of the verse. And then it says, when all the world's doing that, 
And they're doing it because of religious legislation. Revelation 13, 15 to 17 makes that very clear. There's going to be some people that are going to take this position. And these are the people that I want to be among. Look at what it says in Revelation 14, 12. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that do what? They keep the commandments. There are going to be a people. Now, Revelation is very, very clear. They will be in the great minority compared with the whole world population. In fact, in the last verse of Revelation 12. Now, if you have a King James Bible, it doesn't even say it that way because the last part of Revelation 12 is in the first part of Revelation 13 in the King James Bible. Let me just... Oh, I left my Greek New Testament on the front pew, but I can quote it to you. It says in the last part of Revelation 12, it says, And the dragon was infuriated with the woman, and he went to make war with the remnant of her descendants, the ones who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, and he stood on the sand of the sea. The dragon stands in the sand of the sea. Who's the sand of the sea represent? Oh, that's the multitudes of the earth that are in violation of the law of God. The devil's going to stand on the sand of the sea. He's going to have almost the whole world on his side. Revelation's very, very clear about this over and over again. There's going to be a few people compared to the world population. When I say few people, it could be in the millions, but it'll be just be a few people in proportion to the world population that are going to take their position and say, well, no matter what miracle you work, Miracles don't do away with the law of God. I'm going to keep all of God's commandments. Oh, friend, if you're part of that group of people, when Jesus comes, read Revelation 22:14. 14. Jesus is going to take the people out of this world who are obedient and loyal to the government of heaven and kept the law of heaven. I want to be one of those people. You do too. Everybody someday is going to want to be saved. It's like in the days of Noah. Jesus said it would be like the days of Noah. There is coming a time, friend, when it will be too late to be saved. Remember, the door of the ark closed. When the door closed, you couldn't go in anymore. The door of probation someday is going to close. We don't know when. The safe thing to do is to decide you're going to be loyal to God's law before the door of probation closes. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us make that decision. Father in heaven, we know we are living in awesome times. You have predicted through your servant that every nation, the nation is going to be shaken to their very center. And the Apostle Paul told us this. And we are living in the time and we see this developing. We see crisis developing in the world of such a magnitude that we know before this is over that the whole world is going to be shaken. And at this time, the three angels' messages are going to go to all the world, and people are going to have to make a decision whether they're going to believe in miracles or whether they're going to believe your word. And we humbly but earnestly pray that we may be born again, changed in heart and spirit, and that the Holy Spirit may live in us and dwell in us and produce in us that holiness, that obedience to your law that your word requires. May that be our exciting experience. May we be ready for Jesus to come. We pray in his name. Amen. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number? He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth.